Urban legends are a good way to conjure up a few scares around a campfire or during Halloween festivities. But in some cases, scary urban legends turn out to be hair-raising true stories that actually happened, and their horrifying details are destined to be retold for generations to come. Number 5 Scary urban legends about the presence of alligators in the sewers of cities across America have been circulating since the 1920s and 1930s. Following reports of sightings of the creatures in the sewers, the stories grew in popularity, though many people believed that they were nothing more than tall tales and that they were dreamed up by Teddy May, commissioner of sewers at the time. Over time, there have been many versions of the legend. Some claim that a souvenir shop in Florida used to sell live baby alligators as mementos. People would then purchase them as pets, but when they grew too large to care for, they would be flushed down the toilet into the sewers where they survived on rats for many years. Another popular tale claims that a sewer worker in New York City came upon a massive albino alligator on one occasion as it was swimming towards him. This caused for a hunt for the creature that lasted for weeks. The creepy urban legend grew even further when rumors started to spread that mutant alligators had been spotted. They were said to be the result of toxic chemical waste that they had been exposed to, resulting in them having strange colors and growing to enormous sizes. But for a long time, these stories were dismissed as mere folklore until a Pittsburgh Bureau of Highways and Sewers employee was tasked with clearing out a section of a sewer pipe on Royal Street in 1927. He was in the process of removing an obstruction when he realized that a pair of eyes was staring at him. Upon closer inspection, he saw what was a three-foot alligator. He caught the creature and took it home with him. Then in 2010, the New York Police Department removed a two-foot baby alligator from the sewers beneath Queens. And in Florida, alligators have been spotted in the sewers since 2017. It's believed that they made their way through the waste outlets that back out into the swamps. When a storm surge hits, they're known to seek shelter in drains, just like in the urban legend, and they hunt for rats to survive. Number 4 In Mexico, there exist many urban legends about tunnel systems that lie beneath the streets of some cities. It's said that they were constructed during the revolution by royalty, who would use them in case they needed a quick escape, or that they were dug during the Inquisition. One such urban legend was often told in Puebla in East Central Mexico. Tales were told of a network of tunnels that connect churches with ancient buildings and that they were used by Mexican revolutionaries as escape routes during the war. But these claims had no evidence to back them up, as there were no maps or first-hand accounts to go by. But all that changed in 2015 when the tunnel system was discovered when workers uncovered a structure during an urban remodeling project, and the Mexican urban legends were proven to be true. It's believed that the system extends for a length of six miles and that they were found to be high enough for a grown adult to travel through them on horseback. The tunnels begin in the center of Puebla and extend to Loreto Fort, where the Cinco de Mayo battle took place. It's now speculated that the tunnels were used by soldiers as they fought for Mexico's liberation, though it's also likely that they were used by members of the clergy and common folk. Upon exploration of the tunnels, toys, marbles, kitchen accessories, weapons, and other antique items were found, most of which date back to the 19th century. The city decided to renovate the tunnels, and in 2017, they were opened for viewing by the public. Guides have now been employed to give tours of the system, and a museum that details the history of the tunnel has also been opened. Number 3 
number three. The urban legend of the North Pond Hermit was one that was told in rural Maine for over 27 years. The story goes that a man known as the Hungry Man and the Mountain Man would break into cabins at North Pond. These break-ins would always become more frequent over the Memorial Day and Labor Day periods, and he would make away with batteries, paperback novels, kitchen equipment such as frying pans, and packaged food items. He was said to prefer Budweiser beer and National Geographic magazines, and had a particular liking of peanut butter, but disliked tuna. He would never steal anything of any real value, though. On one occasion, he was said to have stolen a mattress off of a bunk bed, but left behind the family's passports, which were hidden under the mattress. Other stories claim that when he couldn't get into a cabin, he would remove the door from its hinges, but be sure to put it back before he left. He never forced his way in by breaking windows and would always leave the cabins in the same state that he found them in, without rifling through his victims' private possessions. Throughout the years, security systems and cameras were systematically added to the cabins by suggestion of Sergeant Terry Hughes, who had the system's alarm signals routed directly to his house. Then, in April of 2011, he was awakened by an alarm, and he headed out to see what had caused it to be triggered. As he reached the cabin, he was surprised to find a six-foot-tall, bespectacled man wearing a Columbia jacket, a new pair of jeans, and high-quality work boots. He also noticed that the man was well-fed and clean-shaven. Upon being questioned, the man would reveal that his name is Christopher Knight, who had mysteriously disappeared in 1986 when he was just 20 years old. He'd been living in the forest ever since and had not spoken to another human for 27 years. Author Michael Finkel had the chance to interview Knight after his arrest, though Knight insisted that a plastic partition be erected between them, as he was averse to physical contact, something that he struggled with in his shared cell. He revealed that he grew up in Maine, where his family lived off the land. The family was obsessed with privacy. He took a course in survivalism, and his father taught him to hunt. When he graduated from high school, he drove his 1985 Subaru to Moosehead Lake and decided that he would live in the wild from then on. His family never reported him as a missing person, as they assumed he had gone on his own adventure. When asked why he decided to live alone for all these years, he stated that it wasn't a conscious decision, it just turned out that way. Once he found a suitable clearing in the woods, he made a camp and started studying the Greek philosophy of Stoicism. He would prepare himself for winter by stealing foods that were rich in sugar and take grills in order to melt snow for drinking water. He stated that he took no pleasure in breaking into people's cabins, but felt that it was necessary for him to survive in the brutal winter months in May. Number 2 We have all heard of an urban legend claiming that a family who moves into a new house decides to do some renovations on their new house in order to make it their own. But at some point during the process, a wall is removed, and to their surprise and horror, they discover the remains of a person inside. In May of 2011, a similar incident occurred at a bank in Louisiana when renovations were being done on the building. The bank's second floor, which was vacant at the time, was being converted into offices, and when one of the workers tugged on some materials inside the chimney, he made a gruesome discovery. The chimney had been closed off during previous renovations in the late 1980s, and on that occasion, nothing out of the ordinary was found. But this time, the worker loosened the remains of Joseph Schechneider, who had been missing for 27 years. Joseph, who was 22 at the time, was last seen by his family in 1984, and they didn't think to report him missing, as he was in the habit of going off by himself. At the time of his disappearance, he had no criminal record, but he was being sought for being in possession of a stolen vehicle. 
At one point, he followed carnivals and traveled with a circus where he sold cotton candy and peanuts. When the circus reached New York, he became stranded and he was helped out by a local church. When he was discovered, he was wearing a yellow long sleeve shirt, a pair of jeans, tennis shoes, and jockey shorts with his name printed inside the waistband. His identity was eventually confirmed through DNA tests, and it's believed he tried to break into the bank via the 14 by 14 inch chimney, where he got stuck and could not maneuver his way out. He was known as the type of person who did things without thinking them through properly, a trait that eventually led to his untimely demise. Number 1 During the time when cell phones didn't exist and we relied on landline phones to communicate, a popular urban legend claimed that it was unsafe to use the phone during a thunderstorm since lightning may strike outside phone wires, travel through the phone's receiver, and give the caller the shock of their lives. But this urban legend was proven true when Jason Finley of New Jersey was found deceased in his bedroom in May of 1985. He was found lying on his bed with a telephone to his ear, and at first investigators were baffled as to the cause. They found no evidence of burn marks on Jason, or on any of the telephone wires leading to the house. When an autopsy was performed by Dr. William T. O'Connor, an assistant Union County medical examiner, he found that Jason suffered accidental electrocution due to the indirect effect of a lightning strike while on the telephone. New Jersey Bell Telephone Company officials revealed that these types of accidents are not uncommon, but it's rare for them to be fatal. In 1984, 12,000 people had been hospitalized for telephone accidents, and only one of those cases proved to be fatal. Just weeks before Jason's demise, a man from White House Station in New Jersey was found unconscious also holding a telephone receiver in his hand. He had also received a shock from a lightning storm, but he had a fortune on his side and went on to make a full recovery. Shortly after, two separate similar incidents were reported at Old Bridge, also in New Jersey. When the wiring was examined at houses in the vicinity, it was found that telephone lines in the area had not been properly grounded due to improper installation. However, the lines at Jason's house had indeed been grounded correctly, and although telephone companies take great care to limit electrical surges of this nature, they've stated that it's impossible to protect oneself from lightning absolutely. What was once considered to be an old wives' tale has been proven to be absolutely true, and it would seem that the best advice during a thunderstorm is to just leave the phone on its hook. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But I've been Ty Knotts and I'll catch you guys in the next video.